Um, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 2. We'll be right here in the beginning, just a couple pages past the contents, right? Um, I don't know if you guys like period pieces, but I love period piece movies. Pride and Prejudice is one of my favorites. I so didn't want, I was like not the typical girl either. You know, like growing up, I didn't want to be the girly girl or the, the girl who liked romance. I didn't, you know, like put pillows in my shirt to pretend I was pregnant or like put a pillowcase on my head to, to pr pretend a wedding. I didn't, right? So Pride and Prejudice, all my girlfriends were like, Pride and Prejudice, it's so dreamy, Mr. Darcy. And I was like, ah. And then I watched it. I was like, oh, Mr. Darcy. And I put a pillow in my shirt and put a pillowcase on my head. And yeah. I was giving Derek some tips this weekend on how he could be more like Mr. Darcy. <laughs> I do. I love time period movies, like, uh, you know, period piece movies. I, I love the King's Speech. Derek loves the Patriot. He quotes the Patriot all the time. We love that. And something I always notice uh, when, in movies set, you know, back before technology and all these things was just how different the pace of life was. I don't know how many of you watched Little House on the Prairie or grew up watching Little House on the Prairie. I didn't. And so it's new for me, but my daughter just read it recently in elementary school and is really excited about Little House on the Prairie, that there's TV, a TV show and we can watch it and see Ma and Pa and everything. But uh, one thing I, you know, as she, I've seen, you know, snippets of Little House on the Prairie and read the book. But one thing that just stands out is, just how different life was and how much slower paced things were. And they're not, you know, there's no notifications pinging and dinging and Zoom calls and, and everything else. And they're working hard. They're working really, really hard, but just in a different way. And it just is such a contrast to the time that we're living in, right? Like, I don't have to, I don't have to convince you of this. This is a really quick point because we all agree we are living in a really saturated, busy life context. I have some fun stats that will, they're kind of sobering. I didn't, I didn't actually believe them when I pulled them. So I had to confirm over multiple Google sources. So you know it's true. Um, you're getting an average of 100 emails a day. That was hard for me to believe until in first service, I kind of thought it hit me when I said that. There are some really, there's some, some people out here who need help. If you have over a thousand emails in your inbox, you're one of those people where, yeah, I don't know how you got here this morning. I don't know how you're functioning in life. I think you need to throw your phone away, get a new identity, new social security, like just start over and you can do better. <laughs> I believe in you. We're getting an average of 100 emails a day, 46 push notifications, 85 text messages, and five phone calls every day. 47% of Americans admit they're addicted to their phones. That's 47% who will admit it. So we know that stat's higher when you account for the liars, right? <laughs> There's a bunch of us in here. I'm one of them. I would say, no way I'm not addicted to my phone. But we check our smartphone. The average American checks their smartphone 352 times a day. 71% of Americans spend more time on their phones than with their romantic partner. So you're all signing up for Relationships 101. You're going to go into a, a marriage course. Oh, thanks for starting that timer. Just some stats to kind of, right? Again, I, like we know this. We might not like to face the facts or hear those stats, but we know we are busy we're on all the time. You gotta turn that do not disturb on. Phones are going off at church and in movies and when we're with people, we're trying to pull ourselves away from this. And because we're so busy, time has become extremely valuable, right? Time is like our most precious commodity. It's a very valuable resource because we can't make more of time. We can make more money, but we can't make more time. And so what I've noticed is we have become like, goblins over our time, just these protectors over our free time. And we love when our free time gets freed up, right? When your, when your weekend gets freed up, like the greatest gift you can give me as a working mom of three is to cancel an event you wanted me to be at. Like, just release me, God, please invite me to your birthday party, but say, you don't have to come. It's going to get canceled, right? Like that is just when you're, you, you experience this, right? Because there's memes all over when the social event gets canceled. Then we all turn into Gollum from Lord of the Rings, my precious, you know, like you cinch the blinds, you curl up in a ball, you get your TV show on, and you're so excited. And I think we have that, that reaction to our free time getting freed up, like the reaction to that is because we live in such a heightened state of activity and being on and we feel exhausted from all of the busyness. 
And so I just think for, you know, whether for work or social reasons or flat out phone addiction, for those who are honest enough to admit it, we aren't great at stopping. And so today I want to talk to you guys about a biblical concept that I, I think it could be argued as probably one of the more disregarded biblical concepts, but one of the most needed for the time we're living in. And that's this issue of Sabbath this issue of ceasing, of stopping. And it's a rhythm of rest that God models for us right here in the opening of scripture. And I just wanna let you guys in on a journey that I'm on myself with Derek and our family about three and a half years ago, we hit kind of a critical point in our life where we realized we are not going to make it. We are not going to thrive and be able to, to live the life that we want and the life that God is calling us to if we don't begin to shift the culture of our life towards a rhythm of rest. And we got confronted very harshly and it was an urgent matter that if we don't learn to stop and if we don't learn to value this thing that God values, we're not gonna be the parents we wanna be. We're not going to have the marriage we want. We're not going to be the kind of employees we wanna be or kind of pastors and, and the leaders. Everything that we're wanting in life is actually, it's starting to break down because we're not stopping. And so I wanted to share that journey with you and, and talk about this together, what the scriptures have to say. So Genesis 2.2, 2, right here in the opening, before humans turned away from God, before God establishes his partnership with Israel, a pattern of resting on the seventh day was established by God. And this seventh day rest we'll call Sabbath. If anybody is from a legalistic background or that word has been abused or that word feels cringy, hang with me. We're gonna talk about what this invitation is from God and how, how beautiful it actually is. So we'll use the word Sabbath, we'll say Shabbat, it's a Hebrew word for stopping, or seventh day rest, which is the pattern God set for us. So Genesis 2.2, 2, God works for six days, he creates the earth and everything in it. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day. That's the third time it said seventh day. So we know this is important. There's something that he's trying to say here, some pattern he's trying to establish. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Then go to Exodus chapter 20, a couple of pages beyond. I'm gonna read it on my iPad because I have the NIV and my favorite Bible here is the New King James Version. But Exodus chapter 20, verses eight, and eight through 11. So here's where the 10 commandments are being given for the first time at Mount Sinai to the children of Israel. Now God has taken these, his, his, it's his nation that he has decided, I'm going to make them my people. He's brought them out of Egyptian oppression where they have, they've been indoctrinated with the Egyptian style, uh, Egyptian lifestyle. They don't have an identity of their own. They've been slaves for years, okay? And so God is saying, I'm about to give you a moral code that will separate you as my people. I'm about to give you identity. I'm about to, to tell you how you should behave, what you should do, and the, the partnership you're agreeing to enter into with me, this covenant relationship, hinges on these 10 commandments. This is what separates you. These are important. And Sabbath is in there, you guys. So it's important, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. God gave us the Sabbath. God gave us seventh day rest. God gave us this and modeled it here in the opening of scripture because he created us to need it. God didn't give us Sabbath because he knew we'd be tired. God gave us Sabbath because he actually put the need inside of our design. Do you understand? Like he could have made us a different way. He could have bypassed, he could have created us like the Energizer Bunny where you could just go, 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 go and never need to stop. He's the creator, he's the designer. But he did it. He put inside of us when he was forming us, when he was making us, when he was designing how we were going to function, he built inside of us a need to rest, 
a need to stop, a need to Sabbath, a regular rhythm of stopping and resting. So Sabbath is important. I mean, it's a major theme of the Bible. Mentioned over 170 times, the concept of Sabbath, this is interesting, it appears in every section of biblical text. So 40% of the occurrences are in the Pentateuch, another 40% are in the prophetic books, and the remaining 20% are in the wisdom literature and historical books. So scholars set forth criteria to determine is something a major theme or a minor theme in scripture, because there's both. And Sabbath meets all the criteria of being a major theme in scripture. It appears in Genesis, it's upheld throughout the storyline of the Bible and reemerges with Jesus in the New Testament. It is a major theme. So it's something that we should look at, that we should talk about, that we should teach on, that we should, we should wrestle through together. And there's a wrestling in it because of how our world is built and because of how busy we are and we're not Mr. Darcy and it's not Pride and Prejudice times, right? right. So there's two main Hebrew words used for rest. Let's, let's dive into those. There's, there's Shabbat. So Shabbat is partially translated into the English word Sabbath, and this word means to cease working. It means to completely stop. Like clocking out at the end of the day, you are no longer on payroll, you are no longer working, you are done. It's a a complete stopping. And then the second word used for rest is nuach, N-U-A-K-H. And nuach is interesting. We don't have an English equivalent to it. Nuach is... Uh, this concept of settling and dwelling. Think of it like that. It's not the same as clocking out. This type of rest is like sitting in front of a fire with a loved one or going to grandma's house and you're unpacking your suitcase for the weekend. It's this concept of settling into somewhere comfortable. Two words used for rest. Shabbat, I cease working. Nuach, I dwell. What's interesting is God introduces the concepts of Shabbat and Nuach at around the same time. So the creation account, He works for six days, right? He creates all the the land and he separates the heavens and the stars and the sun. He does all this work of creating everything. And then he rests on the seventh day. Six days, he brings order to chaos. And then he shabbats from his work. He completely ceases. Well, a few verses later, God creates humans. And then he settles them to dwell in the garden with him. And we see the word nuach. The literary structure there is a link between the two concepts of Shabbat and Nuach. God leads by example as he rests from his work and then he dwells with his people. In order for us to dwell with God, we have to cease with God. In order for us to dwell and settle comfortably and experience communion and reflect on his goodness and have that experience of nuach, which we were actually created for, he nuached them in the garden, Adam and Eve. This is where he places them. But in order for us to do that, we have to understand how to Shabbat. You can't have nuach without Shabbat. We're getting Hebrew here. And there's, this, is, this is upheld. I just want to, you don't have to go there. They'll put it on the screens. I want to just show you how it's re- reiterated in Exodus 23, 12. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall Shabbat that your ox and your donkey may nuach. He wants the animals to nuach. And the son of your servant, woman, and the alien may be refreshed. God wants us to be refreshed in him. But the precursor to that is that we learn to Shabbat with him. And so that's what we're talking about today. And guys, God created us this way. We have to stop in order to be refreshed. If you're living burnt out and frustrated and tense and you're just like, I just feel like I'm about to fray and you're just on edge. And don't be like the liars who don't admit their phone addiction. A lot of us live with that as our norm. We live high, high anxiety, tense lives. And I think that we're missing something here. I think God has an invitation for us. We are not meant to stay that way. But his design for us is that we would dwell with him, that we would rest comfortably, that we would be settled. So what do we need to settle? What do we need to come down from all of that? We need Shabbat. And we need it so badly, it's right here in the beginning and then reiterated throughout. And God modeled it to us, not because he needed it, right? God wasn't like, Six days, just need a self-care Sunday. Just need a little petty, manny business. You know, like God wasn't exhausted. God is infinite. He's God. He wasn't tired. So he's trying to show us something. I put this need in you, people, 
So let me lead by example and show you. Let me show you Shabbat. We understand this with sleep. Like nobody contests that the human body needs sleep. You know, nobody, no sane person. You might not like it. There might be some of you who don't like to sleep. You might think you need less sleep than others. You know, you might try to bypass that. It could be inconvenient for you. You might think, gosh, if I didn't have to sleep, I could get so much more done. But we understand we were created to need sleep. And lots of things happen when we're sleeping. Lots of important things are happening. Here's a, a list of things that are happening when you sleep. Your brain sorts and processes the day's information. Hormones flood your body. Your synthetic nervous system chills out. Your cortisol levels lower. Your, mus your muscles paralyze. Your immune system begins to release inflammation-fighting chemicals. So we understand at a human level, in order for us to operate at our best, for peak efficiency, we should be sleeping well, right? When you don't feel well, doctors say, how are you sleeping? Talk to any parent of a newborn, or don't. I am not, I am not, like there are some people who handle lack of sleep well and some people who don't. I am the people who don't. I just do not, I am not at my best when I am not sleeping. And God gave me three children who would really struggle with sleep. It's really great for me. I had a baby at the same time as one of my friends in Reading. They were like, I don't know, they're 15 days apart. And first, you know, first couple weeks in, first kid, newborn life, she's not sleeping at all. I never knew what it felt like to have your eyeballs on the outside of your face. But that's what sleep deprivation does. They just begin to ooze out. Your eyeballs are like, you no longer have eyelids because they never close. So we're just going to come out. And so I'm talking to her. I was so tired. I'm like, Jenna, how's it going? You know, like, are we in this together? I'm so tired. She's like, oh my gosh, she slept for eight hours when we brought her home from the hospital and has every night since. I love being a mom. I love her. I was like, can I, can we trade? How did you do that? And so she's had three kids. She has never had a baby with, like, with, that didn't sleep well. It's amazing. I said, you need to have all the babies, Jenna. That is why you have all the babies. I don't know what I'm saying. Oh, sleep. It's important, right? When we're not sleeping, we're grumpy, we're cranky, it's stressful. So we understand, like, if I'm going to operate the way I'm supposed to, I, my body physically needs sleep. And I could try to fight that. But eventually, when I don't sleep, I'm going to shut down. You prematurely age, your immune system weakens, things begin to break down when you don't sleep. In the same sense, friends, God created you to Sabbath. You could not like that. You could try to fight that. You could try to bypass that. You could try to redefine that. You could try to rearrange that. You could try to think you're exempt from it, but you're designed to need a regular rhythm of ceasing from your work and being recreated to God. This is your design. We don't get, we understand this with cars. The same thing with an oil change, right? The manufacturer of the car created that car to need an oil change every so many miles. I could be annoyed by that. I could not like that. I could try to avoid that, but what is going to happen if you don't get your car, your oil changed regularly? Yeah. <laughs> my, I grew up, my dad was a mechanic. His name's Rick Ferguson. And so high value for oil changes. Like you didn't get a car unless you knew what to do. Like, you know, I'm like, well, dad, what if I can't afford it? Then do it yourself. Like he, he so badly wanted to teach us how to change the oil in our car and why we would need it. So he was huge on oil changes. He's like, you can run a car for so many thousands of miles beyond normal if you just change the oil regularly. Whatever you do, change the oil regularly. So I met Derek. At, we met, I was 15. He was 17. Derek's dad uh, worked at Ford Motor Company in Chicago for 30 years. And Derek and I had different, different upbringings, right? Derek's was more comfortable, we'll say, right? Derek... Hey, it's your real life Mr. Darcy there. He, you know, he had like satellite TV. I had public access, right? Like Mr. Rogers and Bob Ross. And he was watching like MTV and Nickelodeon and stuff, right? Because they had money. And his parents, his parents, just because they, they always had a new car because the family worked at Ford. So they always, every three, every three years, they were on the A plan. They always had these nice cars. And his parents just took care of all the automotive stuff. Where I grew up, you know, a little bit lower income, blue collar working family in the Midwest. My dad's a mechanic. What we always had like recycled, like our cars were on like the fourth life. I'm like, this car has had many owners <laughs> and they're, they're, they go to the kids before they go to the junkyard. Like he was like, we can do, you know, this can get a couple more drives. And so anyway, when we met, I'm like, we, I have to get my oil changed. I had this 1996 blue Grand Prix. 
And I said, I have to get my oil changed. And he's like, yeah, really? And all of a sudden I turned to him and this is not what a 16 year old girl wants to sound like. I sounded like Rick Ferguson. I turned and I said, listen, son, you got to get an oil change regularly. And you know why? And that's the problem with your generation. You don't want to get your oil changed. You don't want to get your hands dirty. And you just think this, co this car is going to change its own oil. I got to get down there. And I was like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, he goes, okay, get the oil changed. To this day, I'm the one that gets the oil changed in the Honda Odyssey minivan that we roll with, with our three kids. I'm on it with the oil changes. Because if I don't, my car is going to prematurely break down. The same way the car manufacturer makes it that way. It doesn't matter how much we complain. Our manufacturer made us with a need to rest regularly. Not once a year vacation, not a sabbatical season. A regular rhythm of rest is built into your design. God put it there. So he models it and he reiterates it and he commands it. And so three years ago, we hit this point in our family where, again, like I said, we were just breaking down, prematurely breaking down. I'm like, we have a lot of life left to live. Our kids are young. This is not what I signed up for. I don't like how this looks. And God begins to invite us in to understanding Sabbath. God begins to speak to us about this is the missing part. And this is what is going wrong. You haven't gotten the oil changed on your life in a long time. And so you need to understand Sabbath and ceasing and a regular rhythm. And what we realize is this is going to be really difficult because even though God modeled it, he put it in the Ten Commandments, it's a major theme of scripture. We are going to struggle with embracing Sabbath because our world is not set up for regular rest. And so we get into this invitation and we begin to explore this concept with God and we're just, we're just hit with culture. Culture's not set up for this, you guys. Like, we're set up for sleep. Everything shuts down. We, you know, the, the world comes to a quiet little hum so to allow for everyone to sleep. We're, society is built on that need for sleep. Society is not built on the need for regular rhythmic Sabbath rest. This is why this, this made the nation of Israel so holy. Holy doesn't mean better than. Holy means other than. So God's like, you're so other, you're so different. Like I am, you are going to be a people who regularly rest. So countercultural. Can I give you some stats on American work? I think rest is just countercultural. According to the OECD, so it's this, you know, organization of, of industrialized developed nations. The U.S. workers, U.S. workers work an average of 1,791 hours per year versus the country average of 1,716. So this is 442 more hours per year than German workers, 294 more hours per year than United Kingdom workers, 301 more hours per year than French, and 184 more hours per year than Japanese workers. There is no federal law requiring paid sick days in the United States, and the U.S. remains the only industrialized country in the world that has no legally mandated annual leave. Some of you are like, what's wrong with that? It's America. Rick Ferguson loves those stats. He's like, yeah, that's right. We don't stop. We're, this country was built on those stats, woman. <laughs> like, you're like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I'm like, listen, I love hard work. I love to work hard. I don't pride myself on the vacations I take. I pride myself on the vacation days I accrue and don't use. We have like a use it or lose it. And I'm like, I'll lose it because I'm Rick Ferguson's daughter. America. Like, you know, I'm like, just take it. They're like, Becky, you're going to lose your vacation days if you don't take it. I'm like, take it. Just watch them burn in the air. I don't need vacation. <laughs> so I have this upbringing, right? And it's like hardwired into me. And then I get confronted with my God-given design and my need for rest and my limits. And God corrects me. And all of a sudden I get confronted with my pride, my trust, my convenience, my lack of understanding what's important to God. Do you know what happened when God invited us to Sabbath? I'm like, do you have any idea how busy I am, God? Like, I only have seven days and you want one of them? Give me eight days, I'll Sabbath that. You change, you change time and I'll give you the extra. I need a little extra, God. But what I realized is if I'm going to truly adopt a pattern of God, I have to trust the pattern of God. So this is a pattern that he has set forth. And if I'm going to adopt it into my life, I have to trust that it works. I have to trust that he has what is best in mind for me. 
And that's just really hard to do. Bunch of reasons. We, it's so inconvenient. In order to really embrace rest, we have to understand it's inconvenient. Sabbath, this whole concept, and I think this is why America doesn't like it, because we don't like to be inconvenienced either. We're the land of convenience stores, baby. Like we love convenience. And it's really inconvenient because you have to prepare to stop. I'm not talking about Sabbath. Like today isn't Sabbath. There's a whole Anglican, like you, I couldn't get into all the, the history of how Sabbath became the Lord's day, became Sunday. And we're like, this is Sabbath, but this actually isn't what God intended. It's not going to church and then going home and doing some yard work and watching the game and doing like that might be, you know, you could, when talking about how you define Sabbath, but this isn't Sabbath. Sabbath is a ceasing a complete stop from mental anxiety, from worrying, from striving. Lots of people try to adopt Sabbath and they're like, yeah, that's awesome. I need a day to catch up on laundry and bills and grocery shopping. I Sabbathed hard at Target and then we Sabbathed at Trader Joe's and then we Sabbathed, you know. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. And that's how I approached it. When God said Sabbath, I'm like, thank you. I really need that. I'm gonna catch up on all the things. And then I did it for a couple weeks. And I'm like, well, that's really exhausting, God. He's like... That's not Sabbath. So you have to work really hard. Jewish culture works extremely hard to prepare for their seventh day rest. They like do all the cook, because they're not gonna cook on Sabbath. They're not gonna clean the house. They're not gonna do any laundry. So their whole, their whole six day experience with their work is this leading up to the moment, the day of rest. Wow, who modeled that? That's an, that's an idea. Work hard for six days and then rest. And so you actually have to, when you're gonna adopt this in your life, you have to understand it's going to be inconvenient. You're gonna have to be intentional and a, li a little bit disciplined. And now we and our family have a rhythm of preparing for the rest we're about to enter into. I have to be responsible, get everything done. My kids understand. What works for our family in this season is we do Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, 24 hours of Sabbath. We did not start out that way. It was a process. And now my kids understand. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday day, they're doing chores, they're prepping, and like, I don't want to help with the laundry. But remember, guys, Sabbath is coming. And they get excited. Oh, my gosh. All right, yeah, how can I help? So we can get everything squared away to Nuwak. We want the Nuwak. We want that dwelling, that comfortable settling with our family and with God and creation and ourselves. But we don't get that if we don't Shabbat. And we're so bad at ceasing. We're so bad at stopping. We're so bad at wanting to be inconvenienced. But when I embrace Sabbath, I'm saying, I am willing to be inconvenienced to submit to your design. I'm willing to be inconvenienced to trust your pattern works. We all love that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday, but we're all equally frustrated we can't get a spicy chicken sandwich today. <laughs> I'm there with you. I love it. We're like, oh my gosh, Chick-fil-A, it's so Christian and moral. Look at the example for the world. But internally we're grumbling like, why can't, you know, why Sunday? The only day I want a spicy chicken sandwich is on Sunday. I don't even care about Chick-fil-A Monday through Saturday. <laughs> Do you know how other it is for a corporation like that to be inconvenienced to honor God? Like Chick-fil-A is doing it. And you know what it, you know what it does? It provokes questions. In the secular world, why is Chick-fil-A closed on Sunday? Wow. Your life should provoke questions. As the people of God, we should look outside of culture. We should look like we're operating differently. And so again, in the ancient Near, Near East, a day without work was so unheard of. You got donkeys and cattle, and I don't know what you got to do with the ox, but I don't think the ox stop, you know, like the fields and, and all the things that their life, right? It's like little house on the prairie. You got butter to churn and mittens to sew and a kitten to milk. Like you got all these things to do. Life, life's busy, especially in ancient, ancient Israel. And God says, but these people amidst all of that busy, amidst all of those things to do, amidst all of that work are going to stop every seven days and they're gonna rest, and they're going to remember their covenant with me, and they're gonna let their foreigner be refreshed. The second time the 10 commandments are given is right before they enter the promised land. It's the next generation, and they're given in Deuteronomy. And the 10 commandments, the two sets of 10 commandments are completely identical except for this variation on the Sabbath. The first time it's given in Exodus, he says, you're going to Sabbath for the Lord your God Sabbath. So the first time it's given, it's hey, you're gonna rest to remember who God is and what he's done. 
Second time it's given in Deuteronomy, it says you're going to Sabbath so that your foreigner can Sabbath, so that your slave can be refreshed. For remember, you were once a slave in Egypt. Second time he tells him the Sabbath, he's saying you're going to do this every six days, you're going to rest because you're going to remember. Sabbath is a picture of the liberation from oppression that God has done for you. It is a recognition that I have been liberated from the oppression of sin. I have entered into a covenant with God. Sabbath, I get to enter in rest. Now there's a full, there's a full picture of seventh day rest coming that, we, that talks about in Hebrews. That's coming. But right now, this side of heaven, this side of eternity, we can enter in a regular rhythm of rest to remember the liberation of our sin unto God. It's so but it's so inconvenient. It's a posture of saying, I'm willing to be inconvenienced to submit to your way. And then we have to surrender fear. I had a ton of fear around Sabbath. Again, like what are people gonna think? It was so crazy, the, um, just the, the societal, like the social reaction. When Derek and I, we started with just an evening. I just said, we're, you know, 24 hours felt like I don't, I don't know how that could ever work. God will we'll take an evening. So we just started to, to tell the people around us, we're going to be unreachable for an evening. And people are like, why? Are you okay? What's going on? You and Derek having problems. <laughs> like immediately it was, why would you be unreachable? Why are you intentionally stopping? Why are you, what, what's going on? And so we started to say, you know, we were telling our friends like, oh, we're, we're doing Shabbat. Why are you becoming Jewish? <laughs> it was so interesting to me the lack of value, the fear around it, the uncomfortability of our friends. Then I started to feel a bit like that societal. I started to feel a bit like an outcast. And then I'm like, people are going to think we're being legalistic. Gosh, oh my gosh, is this a bad picture? It was just, again, it's just a picture of how countercultural this concept is, but so biblical. So biblical, so important. I urge you, I just want to challenge you and and encourage you to to dive into this for your life. It looks different. Again, it's and and the reason it's not about legalism, Jesus deals with this in Mark 2. They come and Jesus and the disciples are walking and they pluck some grain and it's on Sabbath. So the Pharisees, you know, confront them. Now, the funny thing is they had made the Sabbath so legalistic as they had done with everything. So there was like, a, you know, you could walk, but only a certain distance and you could draw water, but only if the rope was on your left side and not your right side. And the women could do a bunch of stuff, but the men, could, you know, it was just s- silliness. And so they come and they confront Jesus and they're like, you're breaking Sabbath. And Jesus turns to them. He goes, First of all, what are you talking about, you know? And then he deals with this issue. It's not a law. He says, hey, Sabbath, man wasn't created for Sabbath. Sabbath was created for man. And he reminds us that this is no longer, you are no longer bound to Sabbath by law. No one's going to come. You're not going to get, you know, God's not going to smite you. You're not going to lose merits, you know. There's no punishment for not having Sabbath. But just because it's not legalistic doesn't mean you abandon the invitation and the design of God. And the punishment of not having Sabbath is that you miss out on Sabbath. It's a gift. It's a gift from God to you to recreate. We call it recreational time. A lot of people ask us now, well, what do I do in Sabbath? We say, well, it's recreational time. It's to be time that recreates you. So that has become our litmus test for what we do on Sabbath. Because again, it's not about rules. I had a, a young man after first service, he said, can I work out on Sabbath? I'm like, does it recreate you? Now, some people have entered Sabbath and they're like, that didn't, that wasn't good at all. I don't feel refreshed. And we're like, what'd you do? Binge watch Tiger King, (laughs) ate Cheetos. And I'm like, huh? I mean, maybe for someone that's very recreating. It wasn't for them. You should try something else. There are things that we know internally that I know with my family, right? With our context and the kids our ages, there are things that we know that is not going to recreate us. So we're not gonna that we're not gonna we're not gonna spend our Sabbath doing that. We're gonna look for the things, and actually, creation often appears in contexts where Sabbath is in the Bible. Jesus links creation with Sabbath in Mark two. Worship team can come on up. The point there is, Sabbath is to recreate you because you are going to get depleted from all your work. 
God knows this. Six days, you're, you're meant to, you are meant to work. You are meant to exert. You're meant to be fruitful and multiply and produce. Just like God, go and create and put your hand to things. And so much of the Bible is about hard work and, and diligence, right? I'm not saying like, hey, you know, just enter a season of Sabbath and we're all going to, you know, start a GoFundMe for your season of Sabbath. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're not talking about that. We'd have ministry school students that literally were like, I'm just here for a year. God's called me to a season of rest. So could I have some five bucks for coffee? I'm like, God called you a season of rest? Yeah, just a season prolonged. Just going to rest. Can you buy my groceries? I'm like, no, 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 no. Hold on. We got that. God values hard work. He modeled it. But a regular rhythm of entering into a stop from all of that so that you can be recreated that you can go and, and the benefit of Sabbath, you guys, let me just tell you this, it works. It works. Try it. It works. I would never have been able to tell you a couple years ago that this worked for my family. And I'm very aware of that. I have a, a sister who's a, a single mom and I'm reading this book on Sabbath and God's in the midst of challenging us on this. And I was mad. I'm like, God, this is so, this is for privileged people. This is for people who are wealthy. This is, I could not do this. I don't have housekeepers. I don't have nannies. I don't have this. And I'm thinking of my sister. I'm like, this is so unfair, God. Why would you even say that this is something we should do? How do people with harder lives? And I just kept getting confronted and confronted and confronted. I think I know, I think I know better. I think I can understand it. I think my, God's like, your, your idea is better. You think you know. And it was just my, again, it was just pride and fear and, and all the things, my distrust rather than going, God, I don't understand how it works. I don't see how it's gonna work out, but you're the God of time. You're the God of my life. You're the God who created me. I'm submitting to your design. Does this work? Yes, it works. My family entering a regular rhythm of rest has changed the game for us. It has changed the game for us. I didn't know this, but he was preparing us for the season that we're living in now, which is the most activity we've ever had, the most responsibility that we've ever had as a family. And I could tell you that we would not be thriving in this season if three years ago, we didn't lean into the rhythm of rest that God invited us to. So you might be going, I don't know that I need that right now. Well, what is God preparing for you? Does he want to sow seeds of Sabbath and Shabbat and teaching you to cease and dwell because he's about to launch you into something that you're going to need that rhythm of rest to sustain. You don't know what, what he's wait, what's waiting for you or what he's calling you into. So I just want to challenge you guys this morning to lean into any area that this provokes, any area that this bothers or makes uncomfortable and just try it. Do some, dive in for yourself. Look at those words, Shabbat, Nuach. See what God says. Look at the pattern of seventh day rest throughout scripture. The land needs to rest for seven days. Every seven years we have the Jubilee. We free the, the slaves. Like this is a pattern that God was setting forth because it's so important for your life as a believer. Modern day, not about legalism. Not about a day. Someone again came, they said, so what day should I Sabbath? Like, that's up to you. You can figure that out with your life. This is the, the invitation you're invited into is begin to explore. What does this look like for me? What does this look like for my family? And then begin to reap the beautiful benefits. You will find yourself. You will find yourself refreshed. You will find yourself recreated.